Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar in the CERTIP and ESTCP webinar series. My name is Jennifer Nyman. I'm a principal at Geosyntech Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERTIP and ESTCP. The webinar today will consist of a brief overview of CERTIP and ESTCP, followed by the technical portion of the webinar which features research on environmentally friendly pyrotechnic and propellant formulations. First, Mr. Matthew Pustinski from Innovative Materials and Processes will present on a multi-component environmentally benign pyrotechnic delay system. His presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. Second, Mr. Mike Miller from Residine Corporation will discuss the safer and cleaner continuous resonant acoustic production of rocket propellants, explosives, and pyrotechnic formulations. His presentation will also be followed by a question and answer session. We will conclude the webinar with a longer Q&A session with both of our speakers. On this slide, we have provided a few suggestions in case you experience difficulties with the broadcast platform. Firefox, IE, or Edge are the most compatible browsers to use. If you lose the content on your screen or if your screen freezes, try keying Control F5 to perform a hard refresh. If you are accessing the audio through your computer, click the arrow next to the Join Audio button and select Test Speaker and Microphone and follow the prompts as they appear on your screen. If you continue to experience difficulties, please call into the conference line shown here. Um, you may also submit a comment using the chat box, um, but please use the chat box only for comments related to technical difficulties. The Q&A option should be reserved for questions for the speakers. Today's broadcast will be listen only. You may submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions, and in fact, we encourage you to submit questions in advance of that session. When submitting your questions, please add your organization name at the end of your question so that we can identify you during the Q&A. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Robin Neeson, who is the CERTIP and ESTCP Program Manager for Weapons Systems and Platforms. Before joining CERTIP and ESTCP, Robin worked at NAVAIR's Weapons Division China Lake in California. Robin? Thank you very much, Jennifer. I appreciate that. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome everyone to today's CERTIP and ESTCP webinar. CERTIP is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program. It was established by, uh, in 1991 by Congress as a partnership between DOD, Department of Energy, and the EPA. CERTIP's mission is to identify and address high priority environmental science and technology opportunities, which focus on DOD requirements. CERTIP funds both fundamental research as well as advanced technology development, and ultimately, uh, that ultimately impacts real-world environmental management. ESTCP is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program in which we demonstrate innovative envir environmental and energy technologies. These investments capitalize on past investments under CERTIP or from other research programs and are designed to transition technologies out of the lab and into the field. Especially important in all ESTCP demonstrations is the ultimate transition to implementation and regulatory acceptance. CERTIP and ESTCP are complementary programs with much of CERTIP research occurring at the lab and pilot scale uh, with occasional uh, field efforts. While ESTCP demonstrations are primarily at the pilot and field scale, although occasionally supporting lab efforts are conducted. There are four program areas in CERTIP and five in ESTCP. Insulation energy and water program are ESTCP only, while the other four, environmental restoration, munitions response, resource conservation and resiliency, and weapon systems and platforms are both CERTIP and ESTCP programs managed jointly by one designated uh, program manager. Today's webinar uh, presents results from research and demonstration efforts that were conducted under the Weapon Systems and Platform Program area, uh, which has essentially five major focus areas, surface engineering and structural materials, energetic materials and munitions, noise and emissions, waste reduction and treatment in DOD operations, as well as lead-free electronics. 
Our webinar series highlights research and demonstration efforts from each of the five program areas. Upcoming webinars will cover compound-specific isotope analysis for groundwater, long-term ecological studies, and risk assessment approaches at PFAS impacted sites. You can find additional information about upcoming webinars at this link. And uh, I'd like to remind you that a copy of today's presentations will, can be found and downloaded from uh, our webinar page. And uh, finally, we would appreciate it if you would uh, take uh, time to uh, complete a survey that will pop up on your screen at the end of the webcast. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Thank you, Robin. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Matt Pusinski, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Innovative Materials and Processes. Matt has served as a principal investigator on multiple R&D projects funded by the Department of Defense. His work has focused on the development of lead-free initiator materials and applications, pyrotechnic delay systems, and advanced manufacturing processes utilizing resonant acoustic mixing and automated dispensing of energetic formulations. He is currently leading the technology transfer effort to the U.S. Army Combat Capabilities Development Command Armament Center at Picatinny Arsenal for automated manufacturing of green ammunition primers. He holds a Master of Science degree in Engineering Management and a Six Sigma certification from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. Matt? And Matt, if, if you could um, join or, or unmute, please. Hello, Jennifer. Can you hear me? Yes, that's clear. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, today, I would like to present to you the project under which Innovative Materials and Processes developed a novel, environmentally benign, multi-component delay system with tunable propagation characteristics. Pyrotechnic delay systems are used in items that require a time interval between the initiation and output of the item. The range of delay time required varies, and it can range from fractions of a second all the way up to a minute, depending on the application. I will discuss today the background derived from the original statement of need, the objectives of the projects, including environmental and technical aspects, delay composition material and manufacturing process development, performance testing of delay fuses, some key takeaways, and the benefits to the Department of Defense. The statement of need calls for the elimination of hexavalent chromium lead and perchlorate from delay formulations found in military items. Hexavalent chromium is a known carcinogen. Lead is a toxic heavy metal and highly regulated, while perchlorate has been linked to inhibit normal thyroid function. Some of the compounds used in the current pyrotechnic delays contain hexavalent chromium and perchlorate. And these systems include T10 delays, tungsten delays, and zirconium nickel delays. The technical objectives of the project stated that the pyrotechnic delay system components need to meet environmental standards. The inverse burn rate needs to be tunable from four to 12 inches per second, and that the pyrotechnic material needs to retain proper function in the temperature range from minus 65 Fahrenheit to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. It also stated to develop perchlorate-free input and output charges that are a component of the delay system. And lastly, to manufacture and test fuse assemblies utilizing the, de the developed composition uh, when used in the select fuse configurations. These included M213 and M228 fuses that are found in the M 67 fragmentation grenade and the training counterpart, as well as M201A1 fuses, which are used in smoke grenades. 
The approach to meet the environmental objective consisted of developing a binary fuel system composed of aluminum and silicon. We also chose strontium molybdate, which is a similar oxidizer to barium chromate, but meets the environmental standards. And we chose to use silicon dioxide as the burn rate modifier. The combustion reaction for this system is a self-propagating high temperature synthesis process. And the burn rate of the material can be tuned in various ways to meet the performance objective. Aluminum and silicon binary fuel ratio can be modified to adjust the burn rate. The stoichiometry as a function of fuel and oxidizer ratio can also be used to modify the burn rate. And lastly, the concentration of the burn rate modifier can be used for optimization of burn rate accuracy and precision. Throughout the development process, we characterized the delay formulation across various stoichiometries and binary fuel ratios. We were able to achieve reliable combustion with burn rates between 1.3 to 11 seconds per inch. If you uh, look at the left graph, it shows the effective stoichiometry on burn rate. Inverse burn rate is plotted on the y-axis and the fuel to oxidizer ratio by weight is plotted on the x-axis. Please note the decrease in burn rate on the fuel lean and the fuel rich portions of the plot. The right graph shows the effect of aluminum concentration in the binary fuel system on burn rate. Again, inverse burn rate is on the y-axis and aluminum concentration by weight on the x-axis. You can see that increased aluminum concentrations considerably speed up the burn rate. To move forward with the composition, we selected a 25 to 75 fuel to oxidizer ratio and a 35% aluminum binary fuel concentration in uh, the mixture for all delay systems developed and tested under this work effort. A key aspect of this project was the use of resonant acoustic mixing. Resonant acoustic mixing is a contactless, low power, low frequency mixing technology that can be used to safely and efficiently blend energetic composite material formulations while also generating less waste compared to traditional techniques. This mixer resonates in a uniaxial motion at an amplitude of approximately half an inch and can apply up to 100 Gs of force on the media being mixed. It is a repeatable, accurate, and precise process. It allows for achieving homogeneous mixtures in a short amount of time. And here at IMP, we utilize mixing, uh, uh, slurry mixing, especially, for safe processing of pyrotechnics and explosives. One of the most important things to consider in development to achieve high quality mix is the loading order of constituents. We developed the loading order for this technology to enhance the wetting of powders. In this case, we dispersed the burn rate modifier in the processing fluid because it was the most difficult powder to wet. If not done so, inconsistent and incomplete mixing was observed due to the powder sticking to the lid of the mixing mixer during the high intensity mixing cycle. Separation of fuels and oxidizers is also a safety precaution one should consider when developing the loading order for energetic composite material. There are three key regimes that occur during the mixing cycle. Powder wetting, incorporation, and high intensity mixing. The photos demonstrated here at the bottom of the slide were taken at set time intervals during the mixing process. Please observe the powder wetting stage in photos T1 through T3. You can see the powder begin to wet and form agglomerates that increase in size. The incorporation phase is apparent in photos T3 and T4 when the tumbling powder starts to turn into a wet slurry. 
high intensity mixing uh, occurs after photo T5 and can take place when all powders are incorporated. If powders are not fully incorporated between, before the high intensity mixing, the powders can stick to the lid of the mixer and batch to batch variability is increased at that point. Full mixing time for this uh, delay formulation was 20 to 25 minutes. We utilized the chiller system and material cooling jacket to maintain low mixing temperatures. Also, as part of this project, we developed a replacement material for the output charge in the M201A1 fuses. Currently, zirconium potassium perchlorate is used as the output charge, and you can see it located at the base of the delay column in the figure on the left. We utilized a nanothermite material with tunable output characteristics as the replacement for the output charge. This is a similar material we use for our lead-free primers. The graph on the right side shows zirconium potassium perchlorate transient plot of pressure versus time in orange. Pure nanothermite is shown in green and a nanothermite composition containing a gas generating additive is shown in blue. The peak pressures uh, obtained from, from, from the combustion of the output charge were very similar, but zirconium potassium perchlorate had more sustained pressure over time. We did not feel that this was a critical parameter and verified proper function of the output charge in the M201 fuse system. Next, we tested M201A1 fuses at three different temperatures, minus 65, 70, and 165 degrees Fahrenheit. The fuses were tested at Ensign Brickford Aerospace and Defense Company using a specially designed fixture. Two series of IMP fuses and one series of commercial fuses were tested. The commercial fuses are denoted by the darker shade of the same color. You can see lower variance is observed from the IMP produced fuses. Next, we tested M213 fuses performed at our facility and utilized the burn time measuring system shown in the photograph. A shock accelerometer signal was used to define the anvil strike on the primer and used for T initial. The photodiode signal was used to capture the flash at the base of the fuse for T final. The data was captured on an oscilloscope and the difference between T final and T initial calculated the burn time of the fuse. This graph presents burn times of commercially, commercially available fuses loaded with traditional lead-based primers. The fuses conditioned at 160 degrees Fahrenheit demonstrated low variability, while the fuses conditioned at 70 and minus 65 degrees Fahrenheit demonstrated a much higher variability with a considerable amount of out-of-spec burn time on the upper specification limit. Next, we tested innovative materials and processes produced fuses along with a lead-free primer. The green fuses demonstrated low variability in burn times with 100% of fuses performing within the burn time requirements. You can absolutely see the increase in quality in performance. So some key takeaways here, all of the constituents we utilize for the pyrotechnic delay system meet the CERDEP ESTCB strategic goals by reducing occupational and environmental hazards. Resonant acoustic mixing technology was demonstrated to be repeatable, accurate, and precise. The resonant acoustic mixing process significantly reduced mixing times and generated less waste compared to traditional methods. 
low and reproducible coefficients of variations were observed. What does that mean? Well, a coefficient of variation is used to gauge quality. Quality is measured by the level of variability within a system, and in this case, burn rate of the pyrotechnic material. Coefficient of variance percent is defined as the standard deviation divided by the average and multiplied by 100. It usually is required to be less than 5% for man-rated items. The developed green delay formulation here, more often than not, yields coefficient of variation percent around 1 to 2% across various item configurations. This is very important for quality standards. In addition to eliminating the environmental hazards from delay compositions, we incorporated lead-free primer and detonator technology. This led to the development of a fully environmentally benign M67 grenade firing train. And item performance, accuracy, precision, and reliability were improved. In addition, this delay material is viable technology for CAD pad application. And currently, we are demonstrating this in a Mark IV Mod 2 cartridge and a CCU-47A cartridge as well. This development led to the very first fully green M213 fuse system for the M67 fragmentation grenade. This benefit leverages multiple programs at Innovative Materials and Processes. The green fuse eliminates lead stiffening from the primer, hexavalent chromium and perchlorate from the delay system, and all lead components from the detonator. Moving forward, we are part of the recently awarded ESTCP program for demonstration of this item. The green M201A1 fuse system eliminates the lead thiocyanate-based M39A1 primer with the integration of a lead-free M42 primer and special hardware adapter. The M39A1 primers are very rare and specialized. The use of the pyrotechnic material developed under this program eliminates the hexavalent chromium, and the use of nanothermite-based output charge eliminates zirconium potassium perchlorate at the base of the column. So the technology transition is really the ultimate goal of the CERDEP and the ESDCP program. And so the path here continues. Currently, we are funded under ESDCP for demonstration of the pyrotechnic delay in CAD pad applications as a replacement for T10. I've mentioned that we're demonstrating the Mark IV Mod 2 cartridge and the CCU-47 cartridge. We also have submitted a proposal for utilizing an additive manufacturing environment for printing complex geometries for next generation fuses. And we have been awarded an ESDCP as a continuation of this sort of project for demonstration of the M213 fully green fuse system that I described a few slides back. After that, the next steps include qualification of the green delay, qualification of the demonstrated end items, and implementation of technology and industry partners for end, for end item manufacturing. At this time, I would like to thank the CERDEP and ESDCP program for logistics and financial support, as well as Ensign Bickford Aerospace and Defense Company for technical support related to testing and technology scale up. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Matt. Um, at this time, I would like to remind our audience that you may submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. We have uh, received several questions that we'll address to Matt. Uh, Matt, you mentioned a mixing time of 20 to 25 minutes. Um, for that, what scale were you working at? We were working at a scale of between 25 grams and 100 gram batches. Um, 
we were basically limited by the payload capacity of the Labrim original units that we have at our location. Um, we also have um, demonstrated this uh, technology in a scale-up environment at the one kilogram uh, bat scale uh, under the current ESTCP. And we have found that the mixing time does translate to a scale up of, of the batch size. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, with respect to the nanomaterials, um, since the, the knowledge of nanomaterials with respect to environmental hazards is still new, um, how did you evaluate um, the nanomaterials that, that you used? Uh, very interesting question. Um, actually, we have been evaluating the nanomaterial under separate programs at Innovative Materials and Processes, uh, specifically the lead-free primer program. And it's been interestingly, interestingly found uh, through studies that after combustion, uh, the, the, the byproduct of that com uh, combustion is aluminum oxide. And really the particle sizes that are found in the combustion product are very, very similar to someone that would be uh, pig welding. Uh, so, so the hazards associated with the nanothermite formulations that we are working with, which are uh, aluminum and bismuth trioxide based, uh, basically uh, are very equivalent to the health hazards uh, associated with, with someone in the welding industry. And uh, one further uh, point that I could make is we utilize spherical particles and and spherical particles have been shown to be less toxic to to uh, to aquatic uh, life because the cells can can uh, remove that um, as compared to like amorphous type particles with irregular shapes. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Matt, can you comment on whether one of the goals of the program is to eliminate tungsten in pyrotechnic, pyrotechnic mixes? It was not uh, defined in the statement of need uh, under this program, but by definition, it does eliminate tungsten. This, this delayed uh, composition uh, currently is, is viable to, to replace all, all the different compositions, including the barium, uh, uh, chromate with boron, the barium chromate with tungsten, and and the barium chromate and potassium perchlorate with the nickel zirconium uh, alloy. Okay, thank you. Um, to what do you attribute the waste reduction in the RAM process? The waste reduction is really attributed uh, because the mixing is encompassed in a mixing vessel that can then be transferred uh, onto a substrate for drying. There's no mixing blades uh, to be cleaned and, and, and really the removal of the material from, from the container can be done in a very efficient way. And then also cleaning of all the associated components uh, it, it requires much less water uh, to, to conduct, therefore reducing uh, waste even further. Okay. Um, and in the RAM mixing, um, would you get improved results if you mixed in stages rather than mixing all components at once? It is possible that that could occur. Uh, one one uh, thing I could mention that may increase variability during that type of a process is you may get certain components to stick to parts of the vessel um, and then not be able to be incorporated uh, in the subsequent stages. Uh, but, but obviously a development effort would have to be run on pre-batching certain things and, and verifying performance of the end items um, for, for proper function and, and similar variability to, to a one stage mix. Um, and have you performed compatibility analysis of the constituents? We have. Uh, we utilized a micro calorimeter and followed the procedure outlined in Stanag 4147 
uh, to, to show that the fuels, the oxidizer, and the full uh, daily composition were compatible. Okay, thank you. And how did you verify that homogeneity was achieved during RAM mixing? Uh, we used performance of uh, the material in open columns. So we performed a batch-to-batch -batch variability on multiple mixes. Uh, we used a minimum of 12 mixes and then measured burn time in open column configuration. We determined the average and the standard deviation of each of the mixes. And interestingly, across all of the mixes together, combined coefficient of variation uh, was less than half of what is required for a single batch for a man rated system. So we feel very comfortable that we can have half the variation for 12 mixes conducted uh, as opposed to what is required for one of the stringent uh, items for one batch. Okay. Thank you, Matt. And we have one last question for you. Um, what was the reason behind using silicon diox di dioxide as the burn rate modifier in your formulation? Well, in addition to being a burn rate modifier, we specifically chose fume silica, which is a type of uh, silicon dioxide, uh, because it enhances integrity of the press delay columns after consolidation. Okay, thank you very much, Matt. You're welcome. And at this time, we will move to our second presentation, which will be delivered by Mike Miller, a senior chemical engineer with Residine Corporation. Mike has 20 years of experience as a chemical engineer and 10 years of experience as a leader in process development engineering, during which he has taken laboratory process development, or I'm sorry, laboratory technology and developing processes through benchtop to full scale industrial applications. His current focus is developing continuous applications using resonant acoustic mixing technology. Mike earned a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from the University of Utah in Salt Lake City and a master's degree in chemical engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. Mike is a licensed professional engineer in Utah. Mike? Thank you. Um, so uh, Matt talked about uh, batch mixing and I'm going to talk about safer uh, and more environmentally conscious continuous processing using a resonant acoustic mixer of energetic materials. Um, so briefly, the agenda is that I will talk about the fundamentals of resonant acoustic mixing. Um, and then I will talk about the continuous uh, acoustic mixing setup or process. And I'm going to use the, the acronym CAM a lot for that. Uh, once we go, once we've gone into that, I'll talk about the CAM clean and place system, how we characterize the mixing of the, of the process and the system, talk about the uh, clean and place review leading into future work and how we're going to develop this system for use in an actual energetics environment since Residine is not licensed to do energetics. All the work you're going to see here was done on surrogate material. Um, resonant acoustic mixing is a very non-intuitive process. Um, I have some pictures here in this presentation. I would encourage anyone who wants to see uh, videos of that to check out the Residine Mixers website. But when the, uh, the vessel that's in the Residine Mixer is moving up and down, it can move up and down up to 0.55 inches in total displacement at 60 times a second. And in those conditions, that's 100 Gs of acceleration. Now, the first picture in the upper left corner is a, is a picture of silicon oil in a, a regular 16-ounce vessel in a RAM environment. And you see at the very beginning of the mix, what's happening is that there is a, there's oscillating motion occurring in the liquid and in the gas. And this mo what the motion has done is it's created a phase instability. Now, if you go back to the literature and search back a couple hundred years, these are called Taylor instabilities. Um, no one's ever done anything with them before now. But what, that, what the Taylor instability does is it, it allows a beginning mechanism for
for mixing the two components of that vessel, the air and the silicon oil. Um, Matt briefly talked about how the mixing occurs from there. So the pictures as you go from left to right and then top to bottom show a typical paste mixing example. Now this is just simply um, a viscous liquid on the bottom and then we've got some uh, powdered sugar and some blue sand that have been uh, placed on top. As the, as the vessel uh, moves up and down at the very beginning of the mix, the Taylor instabilities occur and you can kind of see that in the third picture from the right and the fourth, I'm sorry, the third picture from the left and the fourth picture from the left, giving the mechanism for how the powders are beginning to incorporate into the liquid or become wetted in the liquid. What's hard to see is that liquid droplets are also being uh, forced up into the powder. We call this the wetting stage. Um, and as it progresses, as you can see these pictures moving from, from left to right, the bulk density of the material is going to drop. So the volume of material you see in there is becoming smaller. Material is moving away from the lid. And then about in the middle, um, after we've got these lumps forming, and you see in the bottom row, left-hand side, materials become wetted. It's formed lumps of material. Those lumps then need to, need to be consolidated into one large mass of material so that the mixing can begin, the high intensity mixing mentioned in the last presentation. That mixing occurs as it occurs, it homogenizes the material. And this occurs, this whole sequence of events can occur over the course of several minutes to perhaps 15, 20 minutes for a pretty hard to mix paste. Now, if you imagine the vessel that we showed in the last slide, and we, we squished it, made it more like a pancake, and then we poked a hole on the top on the left-hand side, and then poked a hole in the bottom on the right-hand side, what we have is the picture you see here is a concept for a continuous mixer. So material would enter the vessel on one side, the left side, and as it moves through the vessel, the vessel is continuing to move up and down 60 times a second. That vessel uh, then acts on the material and mixes it. And as it's moving through the vessel, it then exits on the right-hand side. This becomes one piece of a, of a concept of a continuous mixer. Uh, here on the, uh, on the right-hand side, there's two inches is just to kind of show the scale for when we get to the, the CAM modules later on. But if we take that pancake-shaped continuous mixer in piece and stack them on top of each other with alternating entrance and exits, exits, what you end up with is, and we'll go into more detail in a minute, but on the very right-hand picture, you can see a continuous acoustic mixing module. Uh, it's mounted on a, on a standard RAM 5. Um, and you can see in the middle, in the middle picture, this is paste that is being produced continuously by that mixer. Again, we'll go into more detail, but I first wanted to, to uh, express my thanks for the partnership that we had with Knock WD China Lake in this project. They developed the inert formulations for us to match different um, PBX materials. Now, since we're doing a clean in place project, we had to have a surrogate solid material, powder materials, that were insoluble in water. And so this PBX material you see in the center picture has a, a luster to it or a shiny reflection. It's due to the hollow glass beads and solo, or hollow glass spheres and solid glass beads that make up the component, the, the formulation for the inert. It's, it doesn't look like um, inert paste or actual energetic material, but it was what we needed for this project in terms of water insolubility. Um, we've mixed uh, paste, paste viscosity much higher than 1 million centipoise at room temperature. Uh, what you see here is for that CAMSIP module pictured on the right, we, uh, we mix it at a maximum value of about 3 kilograms a minute or 180 kilograms an hour. So just look at some cartoons about what's happening. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see that we have the cam, a cartoon of a cam stack 
with, uh, again, we still have the wedding uh, procedure that's occurring now. Instead of in time, it's occurring at a location, which is the, which is the transition you make from going from batch to continuous. Wedding occurs at the top of the cam stack. The incorporation phase where the lumps, where the, the powders uh, form lumps and then the lumps have to become a solid mass form in the middle of the cam stack. And then that solid mass is mixed near the bottom of the cam stack, cam stack before it exits. So if you look on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see kind of a cartoon of what in, is involved in the entire cam process. Uh, placed above the cam stack are uh, pieces of equipment that allow us to feed powders, uh, loss and weight feeders with augers were what we used in this project. It's also um, uh, to feed liquids, we, we would use progressive cavity pumps or metering pumps. Those enter the top, those allow material to enter the top of the cam. You can see that again, mounted on a RAM 5. And then in this picture, there's a, a picture of a conveyor belt that then takes the material exiting the cam and moves it on to downstream processing. Here is a, uh, an actual picture, a real life picture of the cam process used for this project. Again, there's a gantry on top with the loss and weight feeders. Not pictured in that is uh, the liquid pumps that are behind the, uh, the feeders. Uh, they, they feed the materials into the top of the cam stack you see there. The cam stack uh, is moved up and down on the RAM 5 in, a, in the RAM, typical RAM motion. Materials mixed, exits the cam stack, and it falls onto that conveyor that you see there and the, the materials then move to the left. Now the conveyor is not moving. It's isolated from the, from the RAM motion. And then you can see the very bottom left is a prototype vacuum degassing system. As material is mixed in the RAM process, um, you can mix under vacuum in a batch process to degas the material. In a continuous process, we can't pull a vacuum inside the CAM module. So we have to degas downstream. Just to reinforce that we are having, we do have the, the typical wetting, incorporation, and mixing phases. Um, I've reproduced the, the cartoon on the left for inside the RAM module. And then in the, in the center column of images, we can see what it looks like for a batch vessel, the beginning of the wetting phase. And then we have kind of the beginning of the incorporation phase for the, for the batch vessel below that. And then below that is the paste mixing phase. If you start mixing, if you start the, the continuous acoustic process, reach steady state after approximately 20 minutes, and then stop the machine and the, and the material feeders all at once, you can then get a snapshot of what the material inside the CAM module looks like. Um, it is quite onerous to clean this afterwards, but you can see if you pull these, these uh, plates apart. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see what I mean. There's a, these plates, two plates form a clamshell that form one processing section. So in the top of the cam, you can see we still have, we still have unmixed powder and we've got uh, liquid with some solids in it. That still shows the wetting phase. And in the middle of the cam, in the, uh, in the picture, you see a blue mass of material with some lumps that are still there. And in the bottom picture, in that row or in that column, you can see we have a mass material that's being mixed. Now, again, that's, you may see some white sections of that material. That's just reflection from the luster of the material. There was no unmixed powder at that point in the can. Um, so the material that was produced, how do we test it for, how do we test the material or how do we test the machine to make sure it's making consistent material? Because of the nature of this formulation with the hollow glass spheres and the solid glass beads, we're able to use thermal gravimetric analysis to measure the amount of solids in the material as it came out. So you can see a chart here. Uh, along the y-axis is percent solids, and along the x-axis is time in minutes. So what we would do is during a, during a run, we would take samples every three to five minutes of material take those samples and measure the solids percentage using TGA. Um, for this particular run, we were, we were averaging 87.5% solids with a standard deviation on the order of 
or 0.5% solids, which if, if you use a specification of 86 to 89% or plus or minus 1.5%, we have a process that's in control to plus or minus uh, three standard deviations, which is what the goal we were aiming for at this particular point. Um, we proceeded there to, to try and understand how do the operational parameters as well as the entire, all the equipment in the process, how does that affect the consistency of the material produced? We did that using the designed experience experiment methodology. We learned two, um, two important heuristics. One is that the solids loading, as it goes up, it increases the viscosity of the material. So as that goes up, this has a negative effect on the homogeneity and consistency of the material. And that's to be expected as the stuff becomes uh, more viscous or thicker, it becomes harder to mix. We also learned, uh, and this was uh, not, I wouldn't say a surprise, but something that was new was not, was, uh, was not known before. Solids loading or the viscosity of the material and the acceleration or how, how, what the total displacement of the CAM module while you're mixing is, those interact. So what that means is that for a given formulation or a given material that you're making on the, on the CAM module, there is an optimal acceleration for a particular formulation to give you the optimal consistency and homogeneity of the material. So if you were to uh, mix different materials on the CAM, you wouldn't need a different CAM module, but you would need uh, perhaps a different acceleration setting. The CAM, the Energetics rated CAM SIP was also designed with temperature control. Uh, this is kind of a, a busy setup here, but as you can see, there's hoses on the left and the right of this CAM SIP module. Those hoses bring heating or cooling water into the man a manifold that feeds five plates. And those five plates have channels drilled through them uh, that allow the, the hot or cold, the heating or cooling water to pass inside a plate in a cross flow manner. This allows the material in contact with that plate to be heated or cooled independently. It's also a series of thermal wells um, and RTDs so we can independently measure the material as it's transiting the CAM SIP as well as independently measure the temperature of the heating and cooling water to determine uh, what kind of heat transfer we're getting on, a, getting on each plate. As you can imagine, as the material transits the CAM is changing properties. Uh, the, the heat transfer at each plate is going to be different. It's that generally, the heat transfer becomes better as the material uh, travels further through the CAM SIP just because the paste material is a better heat transfer medium than the powder material. This chart just shows a series of three tests that we did. On the, uh, on the left-hand axis, we have temperature in degrees Celsius of the exit material during steady state from a, from a mixing run. And on the Y act, on the, sorry, on the, on the X axis is the, for the blue bar, that shows that we were using five degrees Celsius cooling water. And so you see, and then the green bar shows we weren't using any heating or cooling. That gave us our typical about 4, 54 to 53 degrees Celsius exit temperature, and on the right, we're using 75 degrees Celsius heating water. It's a simple uh, graph to show that we had achieved the ability to measure temperature and control the exit temperature of the material. Um, so clean in place, what's the motivation? The, uh, in the picture here is a, is, a, is a legacy or a typical Baker Perkins mixer used in, energetic, in the energetic industry. Do you see it has paddles? Um, and a very large bowl, and when you're done mixing, those things need to be cleaned. Um, on, in, in general, the residual mid material, the explosive material that's wasted during that cleaning process is on the order of about 5% by mass of the total amount of explosive material produced. As you imagine, that's just material that has to be scraped off of the, of the paddles, scraped off of the bowl during the cleaning process. Uh, an additional amount up to 10% by mass of total material made of waste is created just in uh, 
personal protective equipment, uh, glasses, respirators, cleaning cloths, um, and the uh, the solution, the, the solvent used in these is generally a uh, hazardous air pollutant. So workers are being exposed not just to explosive materials, but also to hazardous air pollutants. So the uh, statement of need or one of the advantages of the RAM or the continuous mixer is that as it moves up and down, if you were to add a small amount of water, it creates a very vigorous, um, frothy, foamy material that actually is, ends up scrubbing surfaces. Again, this is this slide shows what should be videos of for very little amount of liquid you can get a lot of foam to scrub the cam sip. So that that's where we started from. Um, the process became that once you were done mixing, you would stop material entering the cam, stop liquid liquids and solids entering the cam, continue to run the RAM five and run out, that's our term for it, as much mixed material as you can. So the cam sip holds, uh, even after that process is over, it still holds about five percent or five, sorry, five kilograms of material inside it. And that material becomes wasted material. And you see the pictures here, there's a picture of what a single plate looks like after this run out process, but before the CIP process. There's still quite a bit of material on that plate. The, the, uh, the next part of the SIP process is to add um, hot 60 degrees Celsius detergent, so water mixed with the detergent, in this case, Liquinox. Add enough Liquinox, um, about four to five liters, while the machine is running. This creates a very stiff foam inside the, inside the cam SIP, which scrubs it clean. So you created about four to five liters of aqueous detergent waste. Then you have to use a uh, very low pressure to pressurized air to blow the foam out, add rinse water, and again, let it scrub another four to five liters and blow that out. And then at that point, you, the result is what you see there on the bottom picture. The, uh, we have 100% removal efficiency achieved. There's not any explosive material left inside the cam set. So, what are, the re what are the end results of a cam sip process of this nature? One is, we didn't use any organic solvents, so those are eliminated. The hazardous air pollutants have been eliminated. The operator, who should be remotely operating an energetics process anyway, has, is now not exposed to explosive material when cleaning the cam sip, and they're not exposed to hazardous uh, solutions of, of acetone or, any, or exposed to the air or the vapor of the organic solvents. Furthermore, the amount of waste generated is now decoupled from the amount of material produced. You could run the can sip continuously for, you know, our, our longest run is on the order of four hours. We created on the order of 400 kilograms of material. We still only had five kilograms of waste, of waste material and nine liters of waste solution. Uh, a, Brief mention on capacity. The residence time inside the cam SIP is what's going to determine the capacity. Because a RAM 5 uh, can, only, can only hold or can only mix 36 grams, kilograms of material at any one time. So if the material has to be mixed for four minutes, then simply dividing the, the capacity, the, the amount capacity by the time gives us nine kilograms a minute or 540 kilograms an hour. The, uh, the residence time is to the first order determined by the viscosity of the material. So thinner materials are gonna require much less time and have much larger throughputs on a continuous system. We are running a trial in uh, next week where we have a much higher viscosity materials. Actually it doesn't have a viscosity, it has a yield stress. Uh, the capacity is gonna, be go, is gonna go down because it requires more than four minutes to mix. Uh, quickly, the next steps are to be are going to be commercializing the process and, and making it energetics rated for operation at NOPWD China Lake so they can make energetic material this year. 
First, we're going to replace the conveyor belt with a progressive cavity pump. Uh, it's class one div one rated. Uh, it also is not going to move. It's sitting on the deck. And so the cam sit kind of moves up and down above it. Um, next, we're going to develop, uh, not as part of the circuit project, but as part of a small business or small business innovative research project, a sensor so we can continuously detect the composition and the mixedness of the material. Uh, and this is one, one possible concept of that of using an ultrasonic transmitter by measuring the time of flight of uh, different paths, we'll be able to measure the composition and mixedness of the material. That would allow us to operate a valve, a three-way valve shown here, where if material is out of spec, we can take that to a out of spec um, container. If it is in spec, we would then move that to the continuous degassing process. And here we just pass the material through a strainer so that we increase the surface area of the paste material uh, while in a vacuum to allow the degassing process to occur quickly enough to accommodate the production rate of the cam set. And again, the, the next step is that this will be, uh, this process will be uh, assembled here at Residine uh, in the next few months. Then once it's been tested and characterized, we will then transfer the cam sip and these downstream processes to knock WD China Lake um, to Andy Nelson's group, where they have, already have an existing round five and they will produce energetic material to uh, as part as the final part of this project. So in summary, um, we've, we have we've developed an energetics rated cam sip with temperature control. Uh, we've developed a cam sip process that's 100% efficient. The energetics rated cam system is again it's been designed with we are through the design process. We're now in the assembly and fabrication process. Soon in uh, the next several months to begin testing, we'll transfer that to Knock W China Lake, where they will be using it to produce uh, energetic material continuously this year. I would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, senior mechanical engineer at Residine as well as the rest of the Residine team. Uh, doc, Dr. Nelson and, and Mike Cirillo at Knock W China Lake and CERTA uh, for, funding, for funding this effort. And uh, also, I want to thank everybody else for their time. Okay. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, we have received some questions for Mike. Uh, just a reminder to our audience that you may submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. Um, Mike, you mentioned a frequency of 60 hertz in the process description, um, but wouldn't the resonant frequency of a mixture need adjustments? as material progresses from wetting to the final stages? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, the nominal frequency is 60 Hertz and the resonant frequency is the resonant frequency of the entire system. So the cam sip, the series of plates and springs inside the RAM 5 as well as the material. Um, so that also depends on the mass of material inside the cam. So as that all changes, you can watch the, the resonant frequency of the system. And again, it, it can vary as much as one hertz plus or minus through the uh, startup process and through the cleaning process. Um, on, it's much more evident on a batch system where you're, the wetting incorporation and mixing phases do cause rather large changes in the resonant frequency. Whereas in a continuous process like this, Different parts of the material are experiencing different resonance conditions, but the material, all the material in the cam sip is in a kind of a quasi steady state uh, situation. Okay, thank you. Can any paste material be mixed? We have not found paste material that can't be mixed yet. Um, again, we've, we've, We've tr not really tried, we haven't done an exhaustive search. I would imagine that the same limitation that we would find with batch RAM mixing, we would probably find with this. Um, and so I would, I would hazard people to, or, or caution people, that if you have material that would be changed under RAM motion, and the, the, probably the most glaring example I have in my experience is lyophilized 
or freeze-dried powders, 100 Gs is enough to collapse those powders. And so they change. If that's not desirable for your final product, then this probably won't work. I've not found anything else that, that theoretically shouldn't be able to be mixed this way. Okay, thank you. Um, what kind of feeders and pumps can be used for this process? The process is pretty agnostic towards feeders and pumps. We are using regular loss and weight single screw feeders and progressive cavity pumps. Um, it, is, it is important to, to select the correct devices to feed the materials that you're mixing, uh, since the variation that those devices impart into the flow rates of material are going to be the limiting, um, limiting case on, the, on how homogenous you can make the material. The, the cam sip will take whatever you get it, give it and make it extremely homogenous. But if the amount of material going in is varying widely, then you're just going to get widely varying homogenous, homogenous material. Okay, thanks. Um, how many operators are, are currently needed to run the cam system? Currently, for the non-energetics rated process, it, take, it requires two operators, one to run the RAM5 and one to operate the um, the equipment on the gantry, the, the feeders and the pumps. That is through a collaboration with NOCWD, China Lake, and Residine, we're going to reduce that to one remotely located operator for energetics processing. Okay, fantastic. Um, and one final question for you. Um, how loud is the RAM 5? The energetics um, energetics model that I showed here in the presentation does not have uh, any kind of enclosure over that. And so it can reach, it can reach about 95 decibels if you're standing right next to it. Um, standard non-energetics RAM 5 modules or mixers have an acoustic enclosure and you mix inside that and it can reduce the, the decibels by about 30. Okay. And um, I think I lied before. We have one last question. Um, you had mentioned hollow glass spheres as a stimulant solids for the energetic compounds. Um, did you match particle sizes and modality of those substituted energetics in your formulation? It's a really good question. I was not the one that did the formulation. It was done by uh, researchers at Knox WD China Lake. I do know that they, um, they changed the composition and relative amounts of the powders and liquids in the formulation to match the viscosity and the density of the PBX materials that they wanted us to uh, test and that they're going to test later this year. So I can't really speak towards the details of how that happened. Okay, understood. Uh, Mike, thank you very much. At this time, we would like to bring back our first speaker, Matt, and uh, we have a few more general questions for both of our speakers. Um, Mike, we'll have you start with the first question. What other industries are making use of continuous RAM mixing? Um, currently, we've, uh, we're looking at, we've had interest from the rechargeable battery industries as well as the um, uh, fuel additive and chemical additive industries. Okay, great. Um, and, and Matt, have you heard anything additional to that? Um, not, not anything additional to that. Uh, we mostly uh, live in the space of, of energetic materials and, and things that um, kind of uh, are related to that technology. But Mike covered uh, all of the other industries that I've heard before at, at various presentations and conferences. Okay, great. Um, and then, Matt, a question for you. Um, what other kinds of energetic materials could be mixed on the RAM? Well, we personally have mixed primary explosives, secondary explosives, primary explosive composites, including uh, the novel and current primer mixtures. Uh, this includes the nanothermite that I discussed and also lead stiffnate based formulations. Uh, in addition to a variety of pyrotechnic materials for various applications. And like Mike uh, described, 
today propellants. Okay, great. Fantastic, Mike, anything to add on that? No, I think that covered it. Okay, great. Um, and can you each talk about um, scaling the RAM processes that you talked about today and, and how um, scalable they are? Um, so Matt, we'll start with you. Okay, I, I, I mentioned a little bit during the presentation uh we we were limited by the payload of, of our ram mixers uh at the 100 gram scale uh but have already demonstrated the scalability to the one kilogram batch size uh under the current estcp uh at uh Dox at uh china lake as well and the next step the next logical step would be the lab ram 5 uh, but I would think for this technology that, that I presented, that would be the final scale up increment. Um, and I know Resdyne has, has uh, discussed this before and, and the lineal scaling is, is very achievable. And I, I'm, I'm sure Mike can comment on that a little bit more in detail. Uh, yes, for, for, paste, for paste mixing, the scaling factor is um, energy density or the power density of, of power going into the material. As long as that's constant, then you should then you will get the same mixing results, mixing time, etc. Uh, and so Matt's process and this continuous process are pace processes and scale up is very easy. It's a one to one ratio as long as you maintain the same energy density for the mix. Powder mixing in the RAM 5 is a little bit more uh, complicated, just in terms of the now the energy density can't stay constant because of how it mixes. It doesn't mix with with the with the uh, mechanisms discussed in these presentation. It mixes through chaotic collisions. Um, but again, it's still scalable, and we can help anybody who's interested in that uh, to how to understand that going from a from a lab scale process up to a production scale process. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank both of our speakers today for the excellent presentations and for answering um, so many questions. Um, and our next webinar is on March 12th, um, and it will be in the Environmental Restoration Program area. And detailed results from DOD research efforts on applying compound-specific isotope analysis for documenting contaminant degradation and distinguishing sources in groundwater. Um, this webinar will feature Dr. Paul Hatzinger from Aptum. Registration is open, so please visit the CERTIP and ESTCP webinar webpage to register for this and other webinars. Before we conclude, I would like to remind you that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on our webinar webpage in case you would like to refer to them in the future. We would appreciate it if you could take a moment to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen at this time. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you.